Next, we come to, uh, an honest to goodness, lovely, straight up archaeological news story. This is uh, on the website Real Clear Science. And I love it. It's a really great little bit of research at Tikal in the Yucatan Peninsula, um, a Mayan uh, city, one of the one of the more famous Mayan sites. And uh, it's some work that's been done um, that shows, as the headline states here, uh, uh, an impressive water purification city, uh, system uh, that uh, the the Mayan city took advantage of has been rediscovered. Uh, more than 2,000 years ago, the ancient city of Tikal in northern Guatemala um, apparently utilized a mineral called zeolite to purify their drinking water. The discovery, published in the journal Scientific Reports by anthropologists from the University of Cincinnati, represents the oldest known example of water purification in the Western Hemisphere. Enduring for more than a millennium, Tikal was an impressive metropolis uh, for much of its history extending from roughly 400 BC to 900 AD, and it had thousands of structures uh, and was home to tens of thousands of inhabitants. And the key to maintaining such a population, of course, is access to clean drinking water. And uh, the diagram that, that they show here is is a quite a, quite a careful fil filtration system um, using zeolite, crystal, uh, zeolite uh, as a mineral and crystalline quartz sand in a way that wouldn't really be replicated until the 20th century. You know, this was very advanced um, thinking and a use of, of geological uh, filtration processes to, to, to pr provide clean water for the people of Tikal. I, I, I love it. I, just lo I love that this sort of stuff is happening. And also I love it as an expression of uh, what we might consider to be a relatively complex and you know, high technology in a world that we shouldn't forget still didn't have the wheel this this is very much a this is another way of doing human you know of humaning uh, and be and being a civilization and i've always admired mesoamerican society pre you know obviously pre-columbian society for that um for example being able to construct uh, as they did without what we for example in the western in in western europe were considered to be a completely necessary element and that is for example carts with wheels on them it's it's amazing and, and you know what I, I, again I, i'm like you I, I love this story because you know any new discovery uh, is mm. to be applauded uh, i've just clicked through actually from the the article you've been quoting from to the actual um report um which is on nature.com articles um on shout out Round of applause, open access. Oh, hey! Yeah. Open access, very good. And um, it's, uh, it, it makes the point, it also puts it in an archaeological context. It, it makes the claim that you know, it's the first known example of, uh, of, of the use of this particular mineral in, in water purification and so on. Um, but it also makes the point um, that uh, people haven't really been looking um that very few large mayan sites have been comprehensively excavated so we don't know if this was a general mayan technology or whether it was a, a technology in general use or whether it was something that had been developed specifically at tikal yeah suspicion yeah. must be that actually given those other large settlements that perhaps it was more general than has been recognized and which mm. is the value of something like this it points up a whole new line of potential research mm. and particularly when um, the maya have been held up by some as an example of what happens when a system, a cultural system collapses in a time of climate change. Mm, mm. Um, and so, you know, um, it's, um, it, as, as the article says, today excavations have been conducted in only a few dozen of the many thousands of ancient Maya reservoirs. And many of those excavations have been limited to a single test pit. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, well, presumably, go back. So, so well, presumably, yeah. because the the presumption is this is just a reservoir for this is just where water sits, and that there's, there's nothing no active happening. There's no technical mechanism for dealing with that water. They just make a hole in the ground that the water sits in, as you say. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Yeah, uh, yeah um, it, it, it's quite remarkable. There's another uh, another um, uh, South American. Uh, in this instance, South American uh, news article mm. that you quite liked, um, uh, it, well, in that part of the world, uh, and that is the giant cat drawing discovered on hillside in Peru. Um, that, now, come, now, on, come on, that is the best article. That is the best archaeological story last month. <laughs> 
finding <laughs> the drawing of a giant cat at Nazcar. Yeah, it, it, it was an invitation to the cat aliens to come and land. Oh, yeah, yeah. I'm waiting for the new episode of Ancient Aliens that deals with the, the, the cat-headed culture. The cat-headed um, culture, yeah, yeah. yeah. Alpha yeah. Centauri, who, you know... Who, 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 who arrived to, to to claim Peruvian uh, wool, presumably, and yarn, hmm. in order to, to go back to their home planet and bat it about, you know? Absolutely. Absolutely, yeah. 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 And, and, but but in, in, in fact, obviously, the, the, uh, the, it's only just been discovered, because up until now, the cat, of course, had been asleep. Oh, of course, yeah. Yeah, it had been resting. Uh, other coverage of this suggested that the cat motif appears on local pottery at the same period. That's interesting. So, right, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, you know, I, 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 I've got a fridge magnet. We used to have a cat, much missed, and um, we've got a fridge magnet that says, um, "The Egyptians worshipped cats of, as gods. Cats have never forgotten this." <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. So I, you know, but yeah, but, uh, but that, there's that element too. Um, but well, we're going to uh, come on to the point, and we've got one more other segment of this, I mean, because having mentioned cats, we've got to mention dogs. Of course we have, Because there yes. are going to be, there are, uh, for all the cat people out there, there are going to be the much more sensible dog people, he said, waiting for the barrage of comments below the line now. Um, putting on my tin hat. No, in all seriousness, uh, there's been a, because there's also been a really interesting piece of research um, looking at the origins of European dogs that's been published in the last mm. month as well. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And um, I think um, we, 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 we need to mention that in the, in the same breath, given the, um, the place that dogs have in our culture too. Yeah, well, absolutely. Um, uh, it's interesting because this story, it, it, every now and then it comes back, this question of how and when it is that... that, that people started working with dogs uh, and living with them and, mm. and how essentially how these these wolf-like creatures became the animals that we know and love today and um, I remember a few years ago now maybe 2015 there was a story that highlighted that there had been a uh, an early domestication event I think it was around 60,000 years ago somewhere in Russia where clearly mm. or what is now Russia where clearly humans and 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 dogs were starting to work together but then it went it went out the window really when it got cold and so in that sense it's an interesting observation that the relationship between humans and, and canines is one of convenience uh, and as much as uh, as much as for example uh, mr soup and i wouldn't think you know to get rid of indy just because you know maybe we, we were struggling to to meet the bills or whatever we'd you know we'd, mm-hmm. we'd drop other things from our lives at first uh it, 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 it on a species level clearly when it becomes too much of a hassle to look after or to feed more to the point um the, the animal in the camp uh then you make a decision to look after your, your own family instead of looking after the dog so it looks like sometimes these relationships come and go and there were probably various um events that that would have would have led to this sort of partnership but in, the, in this instance um uh, the article says that dogs were the first domesticated animal likely originating from human associated wolves but their origin remains mm-hmm. unclear Bergstrom et al. Uh, sequenced 27 ancient dog genomes from multiple locations yeah. near to and corresponding in time to comparable human ancient DNA sites. Um, and they're talking about um, 11,000 BCE. Or thereabouts, roughly. yeah, yeah. So this, this, yeah. This, this, is, this is the event that's led to why we have a dog, for example, in the house today, and why you have a dog in your house today as well. Um, by analysing... It was asleep on the sofa last time I looked, anyway. Well, indeed, yeah. Um, sometimes low-key can be can be low-key, in, in fact. Uh, by analysing... Yeah, these... low-key in terms. Yeah. <laughs> by analysing these genomes, along with other ancient and modern dog genomes, the authors found that dogs likely arose once uh, from once from a now extinct wolf population. And this is very interesting in so much as a little bit, actually, it's not dissimilar to some of the um, things we see, for example, in humans in the south of Africa. Relatively small populations can lead to big changes. Um, They also found that uh, at least five different dog populations, 10,000 years before present, show replacements in Europe at later dates. Furthermore, some dog population genetics are similar to those of humans, whereas others differ, inferring a complex ancestral history for humanity's best friend. And suppose that that translates into 
people have at times lived with and at times had a much a slightly standoffish relationship with dogs as they've been evolving over the past 11,000 years. They haven't always moved with people, but often they have moved with people. And in particular, what's interesting, I think, here is this idea that 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 the the, the event that sparks that particular relationship between between canine and and human is seemingly relatively rare because this is this has come out of a relatively small population of, of extinct wolves meaning that, that you have to have that right balance of a, a wolf which is uh, confident enough to approach people um mm -hmm. but also that is timid enough to be to be approached by people as well uh, yeah. a, a creature which which will un, which probably is quite clever and also uh, develops an ability to understand for example the gesture of pointing that's something which, which dogs universally have is they they recognize a point whereas a cat yeah. doesn't recognize when someone's pointing at something um that's if it's awake in the first place <laughs> exactly um, but also as well language as well uh dogs yeah. dogs have definitely developed a very good uh, understanding of human words and and they they learn they reckon tone they, if not words well, well, it's interesting. They reckon that that well, tone obviously is crucial, but also uh, dogs have been shown to have a, a vocabulary of dozens of of actual words as well. So, so that this relationship is a complex one, and it's interesting that, that this research is getting as closer to understanding that story. Um, do you okay, think? Well, I like it. Oh, as, go, go, as, go as with the previous story about the um, the the the, um, the glyphs and and and, and the minds. What's great about these papers is they're proper scientific papers bounded on on mm. proper you know uh original research or new look at old 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 issues yeah. um but then point the way forward to saying look we need to know more so for example this paper says actually we need to look at older mm. examples of dog dna yeah. so uh, saying you know giving archaeologists a heads up mm. look at, to people working on sites older older than 11,000 bce if you come across mm. dog um, then get it DNA tested well, uh, it, and published. It, but actually, that because yeah. I guess an interesting question that that this that, that that this posits is the mechanism by which dog populations are replaced. Is this people moving in with their own dogs and that those dogs, you know, eradicate the local dog wolf type population? Do people or, do it on uh, behalf or, or of those dogs? To the extent they dilute the yeah. the genome and the rest yeah, of it, yeah. you know. Absolutely. All those other mechanisms, yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. So there are more questions to be answered as to how exactly and why it is that that uh, Loki and Indy are in our lives. That's what I think in the end, and that's why I was attracted to this paper. I think in the end, mm -hmm. it's an ex all, deep cutting right through all the academic, all the academic language and so on. It's compelling, and, and which is fine. It's an academic paper. That's absolutely fine. It's compelling because it's about something that is, particularly in Western culture, mm -hmm. um, why dogs are so much a part of our lives and in our homes. Yeah. To this day, you know, we don't need them to help us go hunting anymore. No. Um, mm -hmm. You know, your average domestic dog, you know, it doesn't. It, the closest it gets to hunting is, you know, chasing a squirrel in the park. And mm. failing to catch it, mm -hmm. like you know, mm -hmm. nobody does. But you know, he, uh, but we, we can see that as a Jack Russell, he's he's um, evolved with the kind of, for example, fur colouring uh, with patches of black and white and brown and, and so on. But it, it's a break-up camouflage for a mm. dog running around under in the you know in the in in in, 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 the, in the barn or under the under under a farm building ratting. That's what you need to break up your outline if you're if you're hunting rats and mice. Yeah, you know. So that that's still in that, that, those mechanisms, the vestigial elements of those mechanisms are still there in play in the in the, in the you know, lineages of modern dogs. It's fascinating. Mm. It is. I mean, in our instance, Indy is a, is an interesting one whereby he um, he's absolutely. Uh, it's weird. He's absolutely an indoors dog. He hates it when it's cold outside. He'll just go, well, I'm going to stay inside, inside. But also, as well, he loves going outside, as often is the case with terriers. They often are described as having another personality. When you go outside, they're just different. Oh, yeah. Partly because they're so stimulated by the smells, I think. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, and in our case, yeah, Indy absolutely, I think, comes from, from a working dog background because he has the instinct to go down holes and, and he, he wants to follow that smell and find the thing. The problem yeah. is, is that he he's absolutely a pet as well. He's, he he is not. He has no idea what to do with those instincts. So he'll he'll go. Oh, there's a smell, and sort of 
want to follow it and but he's 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 also really yeah. bad at triangulation so we'll be walking along with him and he'll see a cat like there's a cat and he'll note the cat is there the cat will look at him we'll keep on walking and then indy will continue to look to the right not back but to the right to find the cat again he has no idea that the cat is is back there now he's so he's got he's got the instincts but he's just not he's sort of He's, he must. It must be a very, a very interesting life uh, to to lead. Oh, we we got the same. We we, we have a um a local one of the local strays that um our former neighbours nicknamed um or called Magic, and she um she she's a a yeah a female young female cat uh, a black and white again cat uh, and you get these wonderful standoffs in the garden where she sh- we've got a terrace at the end of our garden where where we sit and so on. The cat sits there as well. And it looks down the garden, and Loki sits looking up at the garden, and there is this sort of standoff where the cat's got sort of going, you know, if you, you know, I'm here, or whatever. And Loki's trying, what do I do? Do I shout? Do I run up and shout at it? <laughs> you know, it, it's sort of, um, and and you see that you see these basic animal relationships in in, in play, and these instincts in play. Like you say, it's fascinating, and you you, you apply that to this lineage as well, and mm. you can start to you look at animal behaviour in the wild, and then how it adapts to. Mm. a domestic environment mm. and you know talk about the campfire we lit our first fire of the winter last weekend and Lokes is straight down there lying in front of it um with his belly facing it so his belly's being warmed yeah. until he gets too hot and then he walks away and comes, cools down has a drink of water then comes back and lays down in front of the fire again you, you can see this it's all it, it is primeval yeah, no, it is there. Uh, also, is it worthwhile just briefly mentioning, it just occurred to me, this month there was also a story or a piece of research um, mm. that was examining the uh, the uh, um, the origins of pet graveyards as well. That's an interesting one. Yes, um, I think it was it was it the headline something like uh, "Do all good dogs go to heaven?" I think was the was the yeah. was yeah. was the was the headline. But then the and and that that's an interesting thing because actually, the, the, for example, there's a pet graveyard close to us that was in use for a very particular period of time uh, in uh, in Newcastle. Um, and you can tell it was used well from the dates on the headstones. In fact, for, you know, sort of early 1900s it started really, you know, and then and then petered mm. out by 1950 something. I think probably because yeah. it it was more formally a park by that point, and you know, burying your, your pet wasn't wasn't very welcome. But this uh, it's interesting how um, uh, and I think we've discussed it in previous. Uh, videos I certainly it certainly came up in an interview i did um uh, a couple of years ago where that this there has been a shift a noticeable shift in human behavior in recent years i say comparatively recent years over the past hundred years or so away from this notion of a of having a noble man's best friend as in a useful tool uh mm. relationship to being one whereby now the dog is actually a member of the family and the dog mm. deserves, for example, a burial and, and a headstone, and so on and so forth. So, yeah, all of this is 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 absolutely uh, worthwhile mentioning, especially in the context mm. of talking about cats. Woof, woof. 